BBC News. Who's winning the supermarket price war? Evan Davis and his guests discuss in the bottom line in half an hour. But now on Radio 4, the report. This week, the BBC's religious affairs correspondent, Caroline Wyatt, looks at why the Jehovah's Witnesses are being sued by former members and investigated by the Charity Commission over their handling of sexual abuse allegations. They knock on our doors, but what's happening? Britain's it's believe that the end times are coming. But could their financial doomsday come first, as child abuse victims hold them to account? I now feel the only way to get the Jehovah's Witnesses to look at their policies and to change it for the better is by taking them to court. And hopefully that way they may then have to think maybe it's time for us to change our policy. Many churches have faced claims of child abuse. What's striking about the Jehovah's Witnesses is that their explicit policy is to handle such allegations in-house. And it's that policy that led to the High Court awarding significant damages against them earlier this summer. In the report this week, we hear from victims of such abuse who hold the group responsible, and how some former Jehovah's Witnesses fear the organisation's approach can result in the covering up of abuse. Unfortunately, it's easier to be a child abuser within the congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. Island, where on this bright sunny day the beach is packed with holiday makers and families enjoying the sea and the sand and those who don't want to be outdoors are in here in the amusement arcade. It's a place some may associate with Gavin and Stacey the BBC sitcom but last year it hit the headlines for rather less savoury reasons. Child abuse and rape by a long-standing member of the Jehovah's Witnesses. When I was 12 I was sexually abused by my uncle who at that time was a ministerial servant within the Jehovah's Witnesses. It went on until I was about 14. He would come upstairs on the premise that he was saying a prayer with me. He would only be wearing his underpants. He would get in bed with me, pull me on top of him, kiss me on the lips with his tongue, all that sort of thing. Karen Morgan says she wasn't understood when she first tried to tell her parents what her uncle, Mark Sewell, was doing to her in secret. Sewell was also the son of a trusted elder member of the congregation, known as an elder, the leaders of their local branch, or Kingdom Hall. During that time, I told my parents twice, and also during that time, two of the elders in the congregation knew about it. And that's pretty much how it went, really, until I was 16. I was an absolute mess. Karen, at this time, was struggling, unbeknown to me, and went missing. This is Wendy, my family friend, and also a Jehovah's Witness in the same congregation. My ex-husband and I jumped into the car and basically went around the streets of Barry to see if we could see her. And we saw her wandering near her home, near the train station. And she had planned to run away, but decided against it. As she was quite upset, so we took her back to our house. And I remember saying to her, whatever it is, if you want to talk about it, we'll listen, no judgments. Wendy was the first person to believe Karen when the teenager confided in her about how she'd been abused. My ex slept on the settee and Karen and I went and slept in my bed and we laid there talking and then she told me that her uncle Mark had been, she didn't use the word abuse, she said he'd been kissing her inappropriately and touching her in her private places. And we were laying there in the dark and I remember looking up at the ceiling and thinking, I've been duped. And I felt physically sick. Duped because Wendy had been raped by the same man just months before. He'd apologised afterwards, saying he'd been drunk and depressed, so she'd agreed to try to move on. Wendy did her best to do what she says her faith told her to do, to forgive her rapist and try to forget what happened. But knowing he'd abused others, she couldn't. She told her husband and they went to the elders and reported the crime. I think the body of elders were in total shock. The presiding overseer, the man that looks after the whole of the congregation and the hall, said, but this man pays my petrol. 
how can this be? He's such a nice man. Karen's father said to the body of elders that everybody needed to examine their conscience and really should go to the police. Not one of them said, I think you're right, we should go to the police with this. Not one. I think this was the first time that any elders had ever dealt with anything like this. That's Karen Morgan's father, John Viney. Back in 1991, John was also a prominent elder in the Barry Jehovah's Witness congregation. A procedure was put into place whereby Karen had to face the person that she was accusing. So arrangements were made for two elders to oversee a meeting that we had in our Kingdom Hall where I attended with Karen and Karen had to, as a, as a young teenager, say what Mark Sewell had been doing to her. In the room at the time was my brother-in-law Mark and my sister Mary, his wife. Mark denied everything. Jehovah's Witnesses are very keen to adhere to the Bible's rule that you need two or three witnesses to any event. And since Karen was on her own saying it, really no further action could be taken. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that any alleged crime or sin must have at least two witnesses, otherwise it's just one person's word against that of another. They cite a number of references, including this from Deuteronomy, from their New World version of the Bible. No single witness should rise up against a man respecting any error or any sin in the case of any sin that he may commit. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses, the matter should stand good. In general, that, of course, is a very good idea. It's always better to get witnesses to something, to prove something. Karen Morgan's father, John Viney, again. But in a case of child abuse, where someone is secretly taking advantage of a child, it's very unlikely that you will get a second witness. But unless you do, no action can be taken by Jehovah's Witnesses against an individual accused of child abuse. But now there was Wendy as well, in effect a second witness to their abuser Mark Sewell's predatory sexual behaviour. Wendy too had to describe her rape in agonising detail to a specially convened meeting of elders, held in her own living room. So I had three very elderly men, whom I'd never met, come into my home and they all, three of them were making notes like this. And I then had to recount it again to them, and they wanted to know every little detail. Um, I'm not sure if you want to broadcast this, but they uh, were very interested in how far apart my legs were. And I had to demonstrate. So it was excruciating. They asked me that if he was touching me and did I see his manhood and all sorts of things and they said to me don't be embarrassed nothing you can tell us will shock us nothing and what happened as a result of that as a result of that they then went to Mark and interviewed Mark and his wife same same procedure and then they had a meeting and then they brought us together at the Kingdom Hall of Barry and what happened there? We were interviewed. We were not allowed to speak to each other. I had to go through it again in front of Mark and his wife. And then I had to sit and listen to him giving a completely different account. This approach to bring together the abuser and the abused to confront one another in a so-called judicial committee held by the elders is totally at odds with current thinking about sexual abuse. Despite its title, this is in essence a church committee of untrained men. Yet it's elevated to the status of a court by the Jehovah's Witnesses and can decide whether a crime such as rape or child abuse has taken place and how the perpetrator should be dealt with. Wendy again. After that judicial committee, I was quite traumatised emotionally, very depressed, very anxious. So me and my ex went to Portugal for a week's respite and when we came back, that same committee called to see us and said, it's your word against his, there is nothing we can do. When I challenged them and said there are actually two witnesses because Karen has given you the same experience, albeit 
slightly different. It's still abuse. I was told quite categorically that they, the two could not be linked because she was a minor and I was an adult. So it didn't matter that it was the same pattern of behaviour by the same man? No. Not to them, no. Today, Wendy is one of several women in the UK making a civil claim against the Jehovah's Witnesses. Her abuser, Mark Sewell, was finally found guilty in a criminal trial last year of her rape and multiple counts of sexual assault. For Wendy, the most important thing now is to get an apology from the organisation about how it dealt with her abuse. I want those elders that cast me aside to be held accountable for what they did because they ruined my life. I want to protect other women and children from what happened to me and Karen and I want to be believed. One major problem for both Karen and Wendy in bringing their abuser to justice was the way that the Jehovah's Witnesses operate. They believe, first and foremost, in dealing with disputes of whatever kind among themselves, using God's law, in effect their own religious court. You may have had them knock on your door with a pamphlet, or have read that they don't agree with blood transfusions. So what else distinguishes the Jehovah's Witnesses from other Christians? We asked Dr Andrew Holden, a sociologist of religion at the University Centre Blackburn College, for a 60-second guide. The Jehovah's Witnesses are American in origin, founded in the early 1870s. They're a break away from conventional Christianity, so they reject the conventional concepts of the Trinity and of heaven and hell. They reject birthdays, they reject Christmas on the grounds that they're non-biblical beliefs. They're an example of a millenarian movement, which they believe very much in. We're now living on the precipice, if you like, of the end of time, in which a new kingdom is about to be inaugurated. They see the world very much in terms of good and evil. They're very authoritarian, they're very patriarchal and they're what we call biblical literalists. The 144,000 is a scripture that they take literally from the book of Revelation that says that only 144,000 people will make heaven. The rest of us, or the rest of them, will live on what they call paradise earth, where there will be a great crowd of righteous people that will also enjoy everlasting life. They believe that all of the world faiths are errant. They believe that they and they only monopolise divine truth. That's the theology. In terms of sociology, they believe in traditional family values, although not in going to university. That's seen as an unnecessary distraction from the proselytising and preparing for end times. But here on Earth today, the Jehovah's Witnesses are being investigated by the Charity Commission. A statutory inquiry is underway to look at issues including how they protect children in their congregations. They call child abuse a sin, not a crime. Karen Morgan again, who was abused as a teenager by a fellow Jehovah's Witness. Why do you have to have such a detailed thing and let us go in back and forth, back and forth over how many years now discussing child safeguarding policies when it's a crime like any other? They should have one page letter saying if a child is abused you need to go to the police and that's the end of that. Karen's fears are more than justified. We've managed to get hold of dozens of internal confidential documents that are sent out to all elders by the Jehovah's Witness headquarters, known as the Bethel. I've got here the handbook solely for the elders. It's called Shepherd the Flock of God, and it has plenty of advice on how to deal with child abuse. It says that if someone admits to and says sorry, then the abuser can stay in the congregation, but be given a reproof or a reprimand. Elders are told never to put anything in writing about this and they're instructed not to tell the congregation the reasons why someone's been reproved, merely that they have been. Instead, it's claimed here that merely announcing the reproof of a repentant wrongdoer will serve as a protection for the congregation. And there's another letter dated October 2012. It says that the first thing that any elder should do when they hear an allegation of child abuse is to call their head office. It reminds them of the two witness rule and says they can't take action unless there's either a confession or two witnesses. The language is really striking. It describes those who've confessed child abuse as having manifested a weakness. And there's another curious point about the authority of those in Jehovah's Witness headquarters. They also say in their paperwork that 
it's them who will decide whether that person is then a sexual predator, not the elders, not anyone who's had any training, but someone who's sitting in a London office who's never met the man or woman, they will make a decision whether that person is a sexual predator or not, which is absolutely ridiculous. Nowhere in any of the many letters sent out to the elders does it say that they must go to the police if they hear allegations of child abuse or even a confession. They're only told to do so if it's a legal requirement in that state or country. It is true that elders are told categorically that they must not tell anyone making accusations not to go to the police. But elsewhere there's an overwhelming message that these things should not be spoken about outside the congregation. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Britain, as the Jehovah's Witnesses are officially known, declined to take part in this programme. They told us that Jehovah's Witnesses, like all decent people, feel huge sympathy for all victims of abuse, wherever or however it happens. In our view, public discussion can add greatly to the distress of those concerned. This lack of willingness to talk openly outside the congregation has been a feature of many of the cases that we've looked into. Now, Karen Morgan and her father, John Viney, want the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Bethel, to resist the temptation to keep the matter behind closed doors and instead treat child abuse, first and foremost, as a crime rather than a foible or a human weakness. Unfortunately, Jehovah's Witnesses don't want to get involved. Elders that actually did deal with Mark Sewell even 20 years ago and knew of his conduct were approached just to give statements and to come to give evidence in court. Almost everybody refused to do so. They were just not able to provide anything positive to help a victim of child abuse. How can you say that you are going to protect the flock? In fact, they say they will even die for the flock, but they won't come to court to testify for their flock. Does any one of you that has a case against the other dare to go to court before unrighteous men and not before the holy ones? Or do you not know that the holy ones will judge the world? While we've been told that that verse of the Bible was intended for disputes over business dealings, it has been understood by some elders to mean that even child abuse allegations shouldn't be taken to a real court of law. Because of this reluctance to involve the civil courts, it's not surprising that similarly disturbing events have happened elsewhere, outside Barry. This woman's close relative confessed to the elders of a congregation in England that he'd abused a child. All of those involved are still Jehovah's Witnesses, and to protect her identity, her words are being voiced by an actor. He did admit it. He broke down, apparently, and, and admitted it. He admitted everything. And they didn't warn any of his relatives or family? No. No, this is the thing which has got to me since then, because he was allowed to roam amongst everybody, and, and people were having him for tea, and going to barbecues, and there were other children involved, and... Well, nobody was warned that there was a, a child molester in the congregation, so he could have been, you know, molesting others or grooming others. And he was going door to door? Yes, he was, yeah. And to the conventions and assemblies, and there was nobody watching him. Another internal document, this time from November 2014, says the elder's task is made harder because people have become, quote, increasingly proud, greedy and litigious. It warns that elders should never divulge confidential information to those who aren't authorised to receive it, again quoting the Bible. In the abundance of words there does not fail to be transgression, but the one keeping his lips in check is acting discreetly. Do not reveal the confidential talk of another. In the case we've just heard about, the elders took this instruction so literally they actively thwarted a police investigation. The detective involved went to see all three of them and all three of them said they weren't getting involved. They didn't want to. She asked them for the notes or, or recordings or whatever and they said they didn't have them or they lost them or they burnt them or something. But they didn't have anything. And even if they had, they wouldn't give them it. They just didn't want anything to do with it. It was confidential and that was it. They heard him confess, but the police just couldn't get them to write a statement. The elders just didn't want to be involved. End of. 
But they also said because the victim was a married woman, it was up to her to do that, to go to the police, which she did, of course, and when she did, they still wouldn't cooperate. And there is a lot in the Jehovah's Witnesses literature that's given out to elders or that's been put up online about protecting the flock. But as an ordinary person who has not been a member of the Jehovah's Witnesses, it does seem quite odd that the elders, the people in charge of the flock, should seem almost to have sided with the child abuser over the victim. Well, that's that's basically how it was. We asked to speak to someone from the Jehovah's Witness headquarters or the Bethel and we put specific questions to them to answer about how these cases have been handled. Their response was an email repeating the statement they gave outside the High Court in London on the 19th of June. Jehovah's Witnesses firmly believe that children are precious and that child abuse is abhorrent. We are disappointed with the decision, particularly since the court accepted expert evidence that Jehovah's Witnesses in the late 1980s and early 1990s were ahead of their time in addressing the issue of child sexual abuse. For decades, we have warned congregants and parents of the dangers of child abuse and have published information to help parents safeguard their children we will continue to do so. We've come to the small red brick Kingdom Hall in Bury, where Karen and her father used to worship. Like the children's playground that you can hear next to it, membership is as much about the social life and meeting friends as it is about the worship itself. John's wife and Karen's grandmother still come to meetings here, but the family has been bitterly split by the court case. John no longer goes to the hall, disillusioned with the way that Jehovah's Witnesses treated his daughter and dealt with the allegations. Even taking part in this program, I don't feel easy talking negatively about something that I've spent 55 years of my life doing. The child abuse itself has affected my family. Our family is split in that the abuser and my sister, who is his wife, for 20 years didn't speak to us anyway, even though they were active Jehovah's Witnesses. Karen, understandably, decided she just couldn't be a Jehovah's Witness. Her emotions were all over the place. She decided that um, it wasn't for her. When all this happened at 16, obviously I was an absolute mess. I had tried to take an overdose, I was cutting myself, I was in a real mess. And I didn't want to go to the Kingdom Hall anymore because he was there. So when I got to around 17, I just thought, I'm just not going, I just don't want to be a Jehovah's Witness anymore. If this is what Jehovah's Witnesses are like, I don't want anything to do with it. Karen Morgan, like most teenagers, then met a boy and fell in love. But he wasn't a Jehovah's Witness. Solely because of that, she was cast out of the congregation, or disfellowshipped. Her mother and I weren't allowed to speak to her, to have anything to do with her. So on the one hand, we're trying to support a girl who has been abused and is suffering for it. And on the other hand, we are trying to be good Jehovah's Witnesses and follow the protocol of shunning. I would have to say that I struggled because I was trying to be a dad who loved my daughter but also trying to be an elder who loved my religion. I was literally left on my own. Thankfully I had a boyfriend who had a good family because I then moved in with them. Well, that just sounds incredibly tough. It was really difficult, especially not having my own parents talking to me. My parents, I, they would agree with me, it's still only probably in the last three years, I would say, that we've had any sort of normal relationship again. The consequences, being shunned and ignored by your friends and family, may help explain why members themselves might be tempted not to go to the police to report sexual abuse, but let the elders deal with it. This woman's daughter was abused by the same Jehovah's Witness in Barry, Mark Sewell. I was born and brought up as a Jehovah's Witness. It's been my life. We really believed it 100%. We weren't just Jehovah's Witnesses. It was a, a lifestyle. I feel utterly let down by them because they promised such a lot and my trust has been broken. 
I honestly believed that they would sort it and I believed that God would sort it. That's the problem with Jehovah's Witnesses. We are so trusting. We believe everything that we're told. Talk about sheep. But I can see now, I actually personally feel that Jehovah's Witnesses is a cult because you're brainwashed. We actually were controlled you know what education to have what to wear what to eat what association you can have who to marry what work you can do and when you think about it like that you think oh my goodness it you are controlled for karen's father john viney the last few years have been a slow painful process of disillusionment with the organization that once shaped his life and promised heaven on earth for the saved He's still a Christian, but no longer believes in the promises made by the Jehovah's Witnesses. I think it is obvious that changes will need to be made. The Charity Commission are currently looking at the child protection policies of Jehovah's Witnesses. Why? Because there have been so many cases of child abuse within the congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses. Now we either say all those youngsters are lying or something is very wrong. We know they're not lying. I believe the financial situation of Jehovah's Witnesses is what will also force them to make changes. This is the May program of JW Broadcasting. Very recently, one of the governing body members gave a, a rundown of the financial situation, which is quite precarious at the moment. In doing the math, we found that the amount of money flowing out will be much greater than the amount of money that we have coming in at this time. What he didn't say was how much money flowing out is going to settle child abuse cases. For instance, the case in America of Candice Conti. Now there's an undisclosed multi-million pound settlement been made. Right up to date in the United Kingdom, we have almost three quarters of a million pound settlement to a British victim by the Watchtower Society. That's five pound for every Jehovah's Witness in Britain just to settle one case. And there are other cases coming behind that. So I believe the Charity Commission are well within their rights to examine the child protection policies of Jehovah's Witnesses. And victims of those policies are entitled to sue. The secular legal system the Jehovah's Witnesses have, for over a hundred years, tried to avoid, now threatens their unity and financial security. And it's giving non-believers another reason not to open their doors. The report was presented by Caroline Wyatt. The producer was Hannah Barnes. Next week, Peter Marshall reports on the battle for control of the RSPCA. Now, just before the bottom line delves into the business world, next week we take a look at a new economy.